things are not as they should be. used for communication between large corporations, government agencies, and universities. But here, all operations have crawled to a halt. Fueled by junk food and a fascination with cyberspace, these students are 15 hours deep into a cyber sword fight with a new enemy who's unleashed a worm. But unbeknownst to them, the person they're fighting doesn't even know he's in a battle. In fact, he's sleeping right now. Deep in a dream, while the mere 99 lines of code he wrote months before is spreading havoc across the entire global internet. You are watching this road TV. sock, a P.O. box, a socket. A socket is like a P.O. box that a computer can use to receive data from a server. When the worm first enters a computer, it chisels a hole into the motherboard and establishes its own post office socket, which it will use to start the infection. First, it searches the computer for the finger protocol. This is a directory that houses early internet usernames and contact information, kind of like a social network. Usually this runs as a background process on the machine, also known as a buffer. But to hijack the information from this buffer, the worm sends a git call to the finger over and over and over until eventually the buffer is overrun, which causes the check stations to fail, leaving a wide open road. It then attempts to establish a connection to these newly uncovered users, and if successful, it will move on to stage two. If not, it will attempt to use SendMail, an early email program. This program operates on a number of modes. When switched from the default deliver mode to the daemon mode, it will constantly listen on a TCP port. It's listening for good vibrations. Things like a sender, an address, and a get well soon message to your grandmother. But do you hear that? Instead of good vibrations, Morris is sending a debug command to the program. Now normally SendMail would reject this command but being a new system built in the 1980s, many site admins have left the option on, giving our worm full access to the mailing services. It uses these new tools to send the following command package, AKA the vector program, to the contacts. It then waits up to two minutes for a response from the shell, after which it will Now establish that the vector program has been received and the worm is running. Global controls will have to be imposed and a world governing body it will be created. It then proceeds to send three more packages to the socket created earlier. The first is a Sun 3 binary version of the worm a VAX version, and the source code. This gives it two chances that one of the recipients are running either the Sun 3 version or the VAX version. After receiving confirmation that the files are running correctly, the original worm eliminates itself, and the new one repeats the process. This differs from a virus in that a virus needs to trick the recipient into running it through social engineering or just plain misdirection. A worm, on the other hand, can spread without tricking a human. It spreads by itself. NASA unplugs, Cornell unplugs, 
news organizations while simultaneously reporting on the worm are grinded to a halt. He receives an anonymous call. The voice on the other line says, Listen, I know who did it. It's RTM. Now, he won't say exactly who RTM is. He just wants to know how much trouble that person may or may not be in. As soon as the call ends, this journalist knows exactly where to look. He opens up Finger and searches through the database for an RTM. And much to his surprise, a three-worded name surfaces. You are what we disrupt. Good day, friends, neighbors, and opponents. Uh, he's, a, he's a hacker, but a kind of a gray hat hacker. hacker, hacker. The man sitting in the corner is watching. Sir. I, I, I would say from the get-go, I, I don't feel that I'm the opponent of anybody in this crowd. You, you may feel differently. Uh, and I, I respect your right to do so. Across the country at Berkeley, sleep-deprived faculty and students, after 12 straight hours of work, finally crack the puzzle. Keith Bostick, a programming architect specializing in Unix, releases patches one and two. The first two patches fix SendMail so that it won't accept the debug command and compile with the worm. 24 hours later comes patch three. This changes finger so that it doesn't accept the gits call. Instead, it only accepts f gits, which the worm doesn't know how to utter. The patches work, and throughout the university and surrounding networks, their ships stabilize. But since the worm has attacked the main lines of fast communication, the storm is still raging for the rest of the world. By now, an estimated 6,000 computers are infected which at the time makes up 10% of the entire internet. Another call, this time from the NSA. The journalist says, Hey, I think I know who did it. It's... The guy on the other line says, Yeah, that's my son. Robert Tappan Morris, alongside his father, chief scientist of the NSA's Computer Security Center, are plastered throughout the national spotlight. At first, the 23-year-old denies he is the author. He says the entire event is a very unfortunate situation, but eventually he admits to writing the bug, but with no malicious intent. He says he only wanted to create something that could measure just how large the internet is, and his plan would have worked. His worm could have gone by unnoticed as a simple background process had it not been for one simple line in the 99 lines of code that would wreak havoc. This is a flag. It's used to tell the worm that, yes, I have already been infected. Morris could have programmed the worm to simply move on, infect the next guy. It's not worth infecting twice, right? But if he did that, it would be far too easy for a system admin to simply put up a false flag and trick the worm into not infecting the machine. Instead, Robert programs the worm to disregard this flag one in seven times. This way, he thought the worm will still infect the machine, but not check it so much that it will overload the PC. He was wrong. 
Had he picked a higher number, say 1 in 700 times, the worm would still be small enough that it would do its originally intended job as an internet measuring stick. But the 1 in 7 process meant it would simply try to infect over and over, overloading a computer system, forcing it to a halt. Consequently, every machine on the internet. By January 22nd, he's the first person in US history to be indicted under the newly defined Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Morris's defense includes that he intended only a low grade prank. What he touched off instead was a rampant epidemic last November that infected a national defense network of computers, among others. He receives three years of probation, a $10,000 fine and 400 hours of community service at a location far from any computer. So uh, when I was like in ninth grade, I was uh, sitting with the boys, you know, in the, in the cafeteria, and we got to we got a really interesting conversation topic. Uh, we were surrounded by maybe like a hundred people or so in the cafeteria, and we started talking about just how little we know about them, how crazy their life stories could potentially be, and just how much life story there was in that entire room. And I thought of something pretty crazy. How much computer space would everyone's life stories on Earth occupy? Think about that for a second. Just imagine that amount of information. It's also kind of crazy to think that even the people you don't know, like those who basically act as NPCs in your life, still have that massive life story in the back of their head just like you. It's pretty obvious when you think about it, but then again, you don't often think about that. I just wanted to share this because I think it's a really cool thought. Disrupted. Boop, 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 boop.